From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. The Me Too movement catapulted into the spotlight in the wake of the Harvey Weinstein scandal has hit home in Rhode Island. Female legislators past and present now sharing their stories about sexual harassment they've experienced in the halls of the State House. None more shocking than the claims made by our guest on the first half, South Kingstown Democratic State Rep, Teresa Tanzi. Then, truck tolls are coming, but when? Last month on this program, the governor cautioned that the end of year deadline for toll collection to start might not be met. We ask the head of the Rhode Island Department of Transportation, Director Peter Alvidi. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the program from WPRI.com, reporter Ted Nisi. Rep Tanzi, thank you very much for joining us on the program this week. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. So uh, we want to talk to you about the bigger picture, uh, including the commission that you're going to lead. But I want to clarify a few things first, get them out of the way, and then we sure. can move on from there. On Monday, you told the Providence Journal that as a legislator, you were told sexual favors would allow your bills to go further. You have made a decision uh, not to publicly name the person who said that to you, and I assume that still hold, holds true as you sit here today, correct? Absolutely. All right. Um, the state police are looking into this, and we reported you've made contact with the state police. Are you planning on sharing the name with them? Um, no, and, and frankly, they didn't ask me to. So have you already had a formal interview with them? No, there was no formal interview. Um, I had someone reach out to me, a corporal reach out to me, and um, she left a voicemail. Um, I was at a community event at the time, and she um, simply said, I'm, I'm calling to reach out to see if there's anything that we can do for you. I want you to be comfortable with um, whatever decision you make. If you want to understand what your options are, I'm more than happy to help you with that. Um, you know, you can pursue it today. You can think about it. You can talk to us again in a year. Um, but we want you to know that we're here for you in whatever capacity you'd like us to be. So there's no inquiry. There's no obstruction of justice without me having, you know, gone to the police. And um, it's been a very simple, um, very empowering experience. And I want people who have gone through this to understand that, that it's their story to tell and that the police are available um, to support you in whatever decision you make. So, you know, when we think of the state police, we do think of them, you know, looking into crimes and whatnot. Is that your understanding of potentially what they're doing here? Or what's, what's your understanding of uh, what their role is in all this? I have had no other indication that there is an investigation. I've had no other indication that I need to reach out to them at all. I was told quite you know, clearly that the ball is in my court and what I do next is up to me. I'm guessing that if there were an investigation, they wouldn't be discussing it with you or with me. Um, right, yeah. and, and the, with the ball in your court, have you made a decision what, what you're gonna do with them and uh, how are you gonna move forward with the state police yet? Um, I think the role for the state police, and uh, in my case, is to have them be a part of the task force because I want to make sure that the procedures that they have in place are um, the, the best. I think we need to be looking at what the policies and other states are. I think we need to be looking at what workplace policies are across the nation and really make sure that we're offering people the best protections available. And that to me is what the task force is about. And I think that the state police have a tremendous role there. Other than that, I, I you know, I feel like I've done um, what was asked of me. And if someone comes to me again and asks me to do something differently, then I'll, I'll go from there. But at this point, um, I look forward to working with them on the task force. Go Your ahead. colleague, um, Representative Brian Newberry, wrote a lengthy Facebook statement um, mm -hmm. reacting to, to this week's news. And referring to House Democratic leaders, he said, quote, this cloud over their heads is wholly unfair to them, and if this is not resolved, their reputations may be forever and unfairly tarnished, basically suggesting that there, there is collateral damage to other high-ranking lawmakers um, based on um, the, the story that you shared with the journal. What's your take on that argument from, from your colleague? I strongly feel that if I make this about one person, then that's all we're talking about, when this is obviously a much broader, um, a much broader problem. I think it's a, a much broader cultural problem that we're looking at. Um, I've had nothing but support from the General Assembly, from the leadership, from both the leader and the speaker. In fact, um, you know, they both reached out to me on multiple occasions to make sure that I'm doing all right. I don't that would be Speaker Mattiello and Leader Shikarchi? Absolutely. And, um, 
and many of my other colleagues, let me just be clear. I've had a lot of people offering me their support. I think this is an opportunity for people to show their leadership. I think that they can, um, you know, maybe stop looking at this uh, um, in terms of how, you know, fathers of daughters are out to protect their daughters, but maybe fathers of sons right now are the ones that we need to be focusing on. They can show true leadership by intervening, by speaking out against harassment, by um, intervening when they see it. Um, you know, if I see something, I say something, and that's how I know that I've been able to make a difference. Um, I, I, I don't honestly worry about the culture. Um, I worry about the culture up there. I don't worry about the individuals, and individuals have an opportunity to show true leadership and shine in this. I think one of the questions that's come up a lot um, is how widespread is the problem of the culture at the State House. I mean, we all, I'd say as a State House reporter, we all know the whispers about, um, I won't go further with that, but just right. there, are, people wonder. I mean, how widespread do you think is a culture of sexual harassment or objectification or women being not treated in the way we would expect in a professional environment in 2017? Or is it more um, a number of, of isolated individuals? I think clearly with one million Me Too references coming up in 48 hours, Rhode Island and the Rhode Island State House is not unique in any way. What gives us an opportunity to be unique is how we respond to it. Um, I've worked in, uh, I've been working for three decades. I've worked in many male dominated industries. Um, it's how we respond to this right now. Um, it, it is, uh, I mean, we look at other states, we look at California, what they're experiencing right now. We're not alone. I think we're in a better position um, because of this movement that's come up from the Me Too hashtag um, to really make a difference. And that's all I am interested in is having these conversations. And it is uncomfortable. I mean, it's been uncomfortable for me. I think it's important that women not be the only ones who bear, and it's not just women, so women and men who are affected by this are not the only ones who bear the responsibility of having to police the way that they act, the way that they think, because when it happens to someone, I have to think about my response to the, to the person who's doing this, right? I have to actually be the one to control what I'm doing, what I'm saying, how I respond to this. I think the least we can do is ask for it to be a 50-50 split. I think that the burden is on everyone, okay? Everyone in the workplace bears the burden of being, um, of bearing the responsibility of being able to intervene and take that weight off of just putting it on that one person. Um, I, I'm pretty sure we've all seen it happen. I'm pretty sure that we've been in a meeting and seen someone who is maybe a chief editor or maybe a, you know, whatever it is, make an inappropriate comment. And you've probably sat there and cringed and thought, I feel so horrible for the person who just received that. Now everyone is thinking about her in a different way and, and it's, it, it, it hurts productivity. It hurts the individual who that remark is made about, but most importantly, the great people in that room who recognize it, they don't have the tools to deal with it. And that's what I want to do. I want to do this intervention training. I want to make sure that people have those tools because most men and women don't want it to be this way. Your uh, revelation ignited a firestorm. The a story, uh, you talk about a lot of people coming forward with the Me right. Too movement, but certainly your story has uh, stood out among many of the others. It's appeared on network news, newspapers across the country. It obviously has dominated the talk here. Were you surprised by this reaction to your comment, or did you know going in this is going to be a big deal? I was surprised and a little overwhelmed, but there was, to me, the opportunity that I have my whole life been waiting for to change this culture that exists was handed to me. And I happen to be in a position that many women are not in. I am an elected official. I have an amplified voice. And after the hashtag happened, Me Too, I had a million people behind me who were affirming that these are real experiences. Even I'm having difficulty in affirming this and, and maintaining credibility. Um, imagine what an individual who doesn't have that benefit 
experiences. I have a question about that. Sure. So um, you, as you point out, you're an elected official, so you have a larger platform. Um, is the culture for women that aren't elected officials who work at the state house harder? Um, is that environment difficult for them? You know, they see a lot of legislators come and go, um, but they work there year round. Yeah. Uh, is it hard for them? Have you seen that firsthand in, in any way? I think in every work place I have ever been in, from my first job as a waitress to this, it is about power and the power structure. And that's what harassment is. It's not when, you know, sexual harassment in the workplace has to do with a power dynamic. So I can say affirmatively, I've seen it in, in every work environment that I've been in. Um, I don't think we're unique. I think every workplace can stand to, to do better. Uh, the second vice chair of the state Democratic Party, Joseph DiLorenzo along, uh, who was a rep for about 20 years, lost in 1994, uh, he made some uh, dismissive comments about your uh, revelation on the radio this week. There's been a huge push for him to resign, particularly among the left, including from the Women's Caucus of the Democratic Party. The party is controlled by the Speaker of the House. We have not heard from him yet. Do you think want to see the Speaker uh, call for his resignation, D. Lorenzo's? Um, I don't want to make this about one person. Um, but I know, uh, in either case, whether it be about Mr. DiLorenzo or about um, the speaker, I know that many people have stood up and called for his resignation. I was among the first um, to do so. I, I find it um, so deeply disappointing and disturbing. Um, and, and I have asked for him to step down. I hope that he does step down. And if he doesn't, I think the uh, movement um, that I spoke of earlier is continuing um, to create a groundswell so that if he does not choose to do so himself, um, I know that they're investigating uh, different ways that they will make it so that he is no longer in that position. You know, we take a certain responsibility when we become spokespeople for, you know, entities, um, and institutions, and I have always taken my role in the State House very seriously. And my, I, I take preserving the integrity of the institution very seriously, which is why I spoke out. I feel the same way about the Democratic Party, and I will continue to speak out to preserve the integrity of the party because, again, there are so many good people that are a part of this party, and to have this one person be the focus, it takes away from all of the good that is out there and all of the positive that can come out of this. These are hard conversations, but they're important conversations. Well, we're getting close to running out of time. I, I have a quick specific question mm -hmm. uh, about uh, the comment made to you. I, I don't have an idea as to the timing on that. W were you a freshman lawmaker when, when that was said to you or early on in your? The DiLorenzo comment? No, or? no, no, no. Oh. When the comment that, the, about sexual favors to, I, for bills. Yeah, I am not going into any greater detail to the time or the any more details. It's Again, it's not about one person. I've said that it was a power differential. I was a rank and file member um, of the General Assembly, and the other person was not. The other person had a title. I asked you that to ask you this. What sure. is your uh, advice to women just starting out in the, in the legislature then for the uh, freshman uh, lawmaker coming in, a woman? What, what do you say to them? Yeah, I, I think that this pertains to any workplace get to know the other women who are around you. You're always stronger together. Um, and I would say don't be afraid to speak out. Um, I think that these things tend to grow. I think a person who is who does the harassing, they start off very simply pushing it a boundary, right? Perhaps it's an inappropriate comment at first. Perhaps it then moves, you know, into an inappropriate touch. They, you know, put their hand on you. Their hand starts to move. It starts to migrate. Constant pushing of boundaries. I think we all have the opportunity, all of us, to help prevent that from happening and to support people when they call it out. So I just encourage women to be strong, that other people, it's obvious now that they're not alone and that other women certainly and, and, and many, many men. I just want to say one thing. Sure. Six percent of people are responsible for 90 percent of all harassment and assaults. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's one of those, you know, those rules of thumb. Six percent of the people are creating 90 percent of the problem. It's up to the 94% of us to stop that. 
Representative Teresa Tanzi, uh, you said at one point that this is uncomfortable to talk about. Nothing is more uncomfortable than coming into a television studio <laughs> to talk about this topic, so we really uh, appreciate you taking the time and having the courage to do that, so thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank when you. we come back, the head of the Rhode Island Department of Transportation, Director Peter Alvini. Stay with us. You're watching News Media. Oh, Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my left, WPRI.com reporter Ted Neeson. As you could hear, we already started our interview during the commercial break <laughs> with our second half guest, <laughs> Director of the Department of Transportation, Peter Alvidi. Director, good to have you back. Nice to be back. All right. Surprise, surprise. I want to talk about truck tolls to yes. start. Um, so yes. the governor was uh, right where you're uh, sitting about a month ago, I believe. We had yes. her on the show. Uh, last time I spoke to you, you said the state was on track for the first toll gantries to be up uh, by the end of the year and possibly tolling a month later in yep. January. The governor said she was not, uh, my words, not as optimistic. She said it's hard stuff. She'd rather take another two or three months to get it right. And she said she wouldn't be surprised if, if the state decided to do that. Right. It's, we're going into ne uh, November. Where do things stand right now? Right. So we're, we're always striving. You know, DOT, we're um, very much driven by uh, being on time, on budget, on schedule. You saw that last week when we did a bridge in a weekend, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, but uh, this, is, this project is a little different, of course, than uh, building bridge. It is much more, there are many more nuances in it. There are technical, certainly technical aspects of it. There's the construction of them. But there's also the uh, permitting process and the um, legal process, right, that we need to prepare for. And in this case, while uh, bridges and roads are a matter of life, safety, uh, welfare of the people that are traveling on them, this is more of a financial legal kind of nuances that fold into this. So we want to make sure that we do this right the first time, get it right get it as perfect as possible before we turn that switch on so that all of those various nuances, the, the technical, the financial, the, the legal aspects of this are covered so that we get it right the first time. That's and that timeline. Is going, that, yeah, and if it impacts the timeline, it's not as important to us in the case of a toll gantry going up as it is with a bridge. So if that be the case, it will. I want to make sure that everybody is comfortable, the public, the ACLU lately, the uh, truckers, the, uh, the governor, is, is uh, everyone is all very comfortable with us going into this. You're not saying December absolutely. still. I mean, last time I talked to you, you said gantry at the end of We're December. Always, so is, are you push, uh, I'm just trying to pin you yeah. down a little bit. Are you pushing the date back? It could, I'm saying it could. I'm saying I'm not as concerned about that happening if it does. Uh, but we're still going to drive to December. Truckers are. They would like to hear a date from you as to when that you think I'm, it's... I'm sure they would, but I'm not, I, excuse the pun, but I'm not driven to complete a project on the basis of the trucker's time schedule. Boo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the ACLU there. They, uh, about a, two weeks ago maybe now, uh, they yes. raised some concerns about the privacy uh, protections that will be embedded in the tool since they will be having cameras and taking pictures and things like that. Right. I believe you've, you've now had discussions since then with the ACLU. Where does that stand? And we're having more discussions with them. I think uh, our, my legal staff either had a meeting with them yesterday and will again in the next few days. Um, we, I, I think we know what the ACLU is concerned about. And it's our concern too that the data that's held in this or the data that we collect to uh, basically send invoices out to the truck uh, trucking owners that are, are responsible for paying the tolls is done in a way that any additional data that we could collect on either vehicles or, or that isn't used in other ways, isn't used uh, to sell to advertising agencies, isn't used to make available uh, to the general public. And we never had any intention of doing that. We share those concerns. What we, uh, what we will be doing in conjunction and working with the ACLU is actually promulgating those controls that will restrict the use of that data in any other way. And, and we're also working internally after hearing the concerns of the ACLU, and we're feeding that, those concerns back into the technological aspect of this because we think there's a way at the very, at the very collection 
point of these at the gantry itself to filter out any information on uh, passenger vehicles or other vehicles that we're not going to be invoicing and filter it out right at that point so that it's not even stored on the system. So there's this kind of iterative process and this goes to the complexity of the issues that we were talking about, right? Uh, if, if making sure that we get this right causes a bit of delay, it's more important we get this right. And, um, and we're working on that. But we're always working in the context of being driven toward um, a deadline and, uh, and, a, and keeping things within cost, you have which we've been doing a pretty good job of during the last couple of years. You've seen uh, projects roll out. You've seen us, like last week, build bridges in a day. Well, I want to talk about another bridge yeah. that, that's not going to be built in a day. You yes. have a major project on the horizon, the 610, a bunch of bridges yes. there need to be replaced. Yep. I remember the Roadworks press conference was held under one of them, and yep. it was scary to be under it. Right. Um, where does that stand? What's the timeline? And most importantly to the people that are watching this that use the 610, they want to know how they're going to be impacted. Is traffic going to be... Uh, you know, shifted by a lane as the mm -hmm. bridges are replaced, or are you going to do like 95 in Pawtucket, shifting it over to secondary roads to get around the 610? Yes, that's a that's a great question. So, uh, 610 is probably the cornerstone project that exemplifies what our roadworks program is all about. We're taking a project that uh, and a bridge uh, or a series of bridges there, right, that have been decaying for decades, and we finally found a way to move it into actually being rebuilt. The financing, the planning, the execution, the kind of project delivery, a design build kind of project delivery is all new to DOT and we're actually doing it. And Roadworks made it possible for us to move that project off the shelf for 30 years and into the dirt and get constructed. We've been conducting a competitive process between two major groups of companies, uh, each group containing about five or six different companies, design and build uh, components, that um, by December, actually by November, will be completed with the uh, selection process. We'll have selected one so that in December we will have a groundbreaking uh, to begin that project. Uh, to your concern, one of the aspects of the design-build competition that we introduced into the competition with these companies is show us the way that you're going to mitigate the traffic during construction because it's a five or six year period that this interchange is going to take to get rebuilt. We only have a couple minutes left, so I want to make sure you get to that. Yep. So, uh, so we are, we are uh, having that be a consideration and one of the requirements is that all uh, lanes of traffic are kept open hmm. during the reconstruction. That is, if there are three lanes servicing a particular area now, there will still be three lanes during construction. So you won't be weaving through Olneyville? No. We will not be diverting traffic through local roads to, uh, to construct this. The construction will happen and the main lanes of traffic will, will be open continuously throughout the construction. I apologize if I missed it. Did you say, when do you expect to break ground on the first 610 project? Uh, actually, the, the whole thing is going to break ground in uh, December. You'll see real activity in the spring, but uh, in late December we'll, we're still on target and uh, on time and on budget to have a groundbreaking at that point. So um, the Roadworks signs, the signs that are up yes. there, uh, the governor's name is no longer going to be on them. You had some back and forth with the federal highway folks. Um, they said in a quote to Tim, quote, they, they're continuing to work with you on this matter. Could, could you be fined? Is it possible Rida will face any punishment for the governor's name being on the signs and they don't like no, it? No, absolutely not. We did that with their knowledge and consent. Um, and there have been discussions going on at um, Federal Highway Administration They've asked us to conform to additional standards. We are. Uh, it's been resolved. The new signs you'll begin to see on projects uh, coming up. Some of the older signs that we're announcing the projects happening in the future are coming down. And we're going into a, a state of conformance. There'll be green, green and white signs. They'll still have the component that we're most interested in. Well, the reason for the science in the first place is to show people what we're doing with their money and how we're using it. 
whether we're, we're keeping these projects on time and within budget. And the science will still give that information, which is what is important to us. We have about a minute left. Uh, Director LVD, uh, what about your future? How long do you anticipate being in the position that you're in right now? I, I'm having a lot of fun doing this. Uh, it, it is a, it's a great experience for me. It's very rewarding. Um, I'm here for as long as the governor wants me or needs me to be here. Um, I'm very happy doing my job, and I think we're making a lot of progress. I'm, I'm still as excited about doing it as I was on the first day, the time we met uh, almost two and a half years ago on this show. And um, I'll continue to do it for as long as I, I'm needed. All right, Director Alvidi, thank you very much for joining us on the program. We're going to have you back uh, maybe close to December when the 610 thing kicks off. Yes. I hope you'll join us. Yes. Our thanks to our first half guest, Representative Teresa Tanzi. If you missed any of it, it's online, WPRI.com. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.